I do have a guide voice, so I think I can probably project, but uh, just in case, I'll, there's the, uh, the microphone. I'll try to be faithful to it. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I have to tell you, uh, it was quite a, an honor, and I was a little intimidated uh, by this request because it came from the famous Ed Coleman uh, whose articles have informed me on the Acadian presence in the valley for years. Um, I wondered what on earth can I tell these people that from the Kentville Historical Society that you don't already know. I'm pretty sure that some of you in attendance here already know lots about Acadians. Uh, you probably know that the first families arrived in their Acadie, our Nova Scotia, in the early 1630s. And uh, after a short stop in La Have, uh, near Bridgewater, uh, the whole settlement was moved to the Annapolis Royal area where it took root. Uh, then subsequent generations migrated to the area that was called the Min on their maps. It included the present-day Canard, Grand Pre, the Windsor districts, all in the Minas Basin. So you know where Le Min Minas comes from? Okay. Yeah, okay. Great. So let's just look at. Um, yeah. I'm going to show you a few maps, and so this is a little orientation on some old maps, and uh, this is, of course, Grand Pre. So, it looks sort of familiar, sort of. You might recognize the river. You probably know that some of the things that prompted the uh, migration were expanding families, limited farmland in Annapolis Royal, because, you know, there's only so much you can dike and farm, and the search for adventure, the promise of prosperity by taming the tides, the highest tides in the world, with their innovative system of diking. Let's look at the maps for a minute so we all know what we're looking at. So you know Grand Pre you recognize, and uh, you realize that the settlement pa patterns is always along the rivers that, that go into the Minas Basin right there. So you, of course, uh, recognize the Gasparo. Uh, you'll see on the a guide here that the colors, the purple is the parish of St. Charles. I'll talk about that later, but basically let's look at the rivers now. So you have the Gasparo, you have the, uh, what we call the Cornwallis today, which at the time of the Acadians was Saint Antoine. And then of course we have the Canard River, and so that is called La Riviera Canard in Acadian times. Then of course La Vieille Habitation is habitation, habitant, the Habitant River, you notice when you drive the canny. And then way up there, the Perot River. So that's, that's what it looked like back in 1714 when it was mapped. We also want to look at Pisiquid because that's part of the Min too. So that's the Windsor area. Pisiquid is spelled 60,000 different ways and pronounced just about as many times, but we're going to settle on Pisiquid. Uh, of course, the river Pisiquid is the Avon River today, and then the river Saint Croix, Saint Croix is of course, you recognize it at Saint Croix. So you notice that the settlement patterns is always around the rivers. Now, of course, the other thing is uh, the Acadians didn't mind that moving here and the lack of supervision by the military governments at the fort in Annapolis Royal was of course a nice feature of the Min. A little bit far enough away and very attractive to the Acadians' independent spirit. We're gonna look again at the Grand Pre map. Okay, where am I? All right, oh, it went too far, so now let's, okay, here we are. So, Well, I do know that probably most of you are familiar with the founder of Grand Pre. That would be Pierre Melasso and his well-connected wife, Marguerite Muse d'Entremont. 
Now her father, of course, Marguerite's father, was a French baron, and he held important positions when the French were in charge of Acadie. Now, a little recall, it changed between the English and the French seven times in the times that the Acadians lived here. So it was, uh, I know when I was a guide at Grand Prix, people would always ask, well, what's, you know, how is that different than in Quebec? Well, in Quebec, it was French the whole time. There was, there was missionaries, there were priests, there was the military, but here, well, until, of course, the plains of Abraham, and then it changed. But here it changed over the time that people were here. So it makes, it, it makes a whole different atmosphere, let's say, in a community. So that's something to keep in mind on the Acadians as well that is different from other French Canadians. So, um, yes, yeah, so you know that, uh, yes, it changed seven times. Now, you know that the Melanson family famously are always associated with Grand Pre, but really they were living along the Gaspereau. You see, they brought all kinds of other people, as you can tell, uh, and so these little houses represent uh, 10 people. So, uh, and it's only 1714, which is fairly early on. So they settle along the Gasper River, and of course, Pierre Melanson is credited with having dyked the land that is the Grand Pre. So when they first got here, then uh, this was underwater at high tide, and this was Long Island, an island that is still there, and this was the uplands of, at Grand Pre today. So diking all of this land, taking all of this land from the sea is quite an audacious project. You have to hand them that. Of course, uh, UNESCO uh, recognized all of that uh, a little more than 10 years ago. The, product, uh, the project produced uh, acres of fertile soil where settlers could go cro grow crops for themselves and sell to traders who sailed up from Boston. Now, later in the settlement, this is a little early, they could also supply the French fortress at Louisbourg on Cape Breton Island. Now, the whole area, though, kind of got the name of Grand Pre, even though <coughs> But you know why it got the whole area got the name of Grand Pre, of course. It all has to do with our famous girl from the area, Evangeline. Yes, so thanks to uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, then we have the story of Evangeline, and he places her as a girl from Grand Pre. So the whole rest of us have all been associated with Grand Pre ever since. But, so that's interesting about Grand Pre, but I wanted to know, what about the other Acadian communities in the area? Um, and that is what I was asked to speak about. So, uh, you know about the Kennard River settlement, <coughs> and uh, you know, probably there is much more to the Kennard River settlement than the blue sign you drive past every time you're on that highway driving to Canning from Port Williams, etc., and you see that sign. By the way, I'm very proud of that sign. I worked with uh, John Lore and Richard Lore on that, and uh, I'll tell you, it took like five years to get a sign. But in the end, we got a sign. And uh, now you know that, uh, what, you will know why it's there, why it's important. It would be nice to have a larger project, but you know, we can only do what we can do. Now, if you're driving along the road to Canning, on the uh, road to Canning, the 358, we call it, you are actually going to be driving on the Acadian Grand Duck. So that, the road sits on where the dike was. And it's important because it's the last of the dikes that were uh, put up by the Acadians before the deportation. There's a series of cross dikes upriver, the middle dike road, the upper dike, etc. But the grand dike is Route 358 to you today. So it's worthwhile noting. So we're going to look a little bit closer at the families, though, who were. Uh, well, let's just go back. We're going to go back again to, okay. Da, da, da. Okay. So yes, so we know more about
about the rivers. And the whole sediment pattern has to do with the rivers, as I said. It's easy to understand that when you look at where the little houses are. And this is only 1714, so they're here in the late 1600s. So this is not that long. This is like 30 years before the first family comes. So that, that this is by no means complete to, to what was there in 1755, for instance. So we know that uh, the Cornwallis River was called the Rivière des Habitants, and the Mi'kmaq called it uh, Jujuwaktuk, and uh, it's a little interesting that it's Saint Antoine, but I'll tell you that later, what my suspicion is about that. <laughs> the other one, the Canary River, well, as you saw on the blue sign, it has a very long and difficult for a French person to pronounce Mi'kmaq name, which I'll give it a try though. Ochikuma Wakichi. Something to that effect. You really uh, can find out how to pronounce it and where the names are by going online at the mi'kma'placenames.ca, which is an amazing website. Now, it's interesting to know that Ochikuma Wakichi actually meant the meaning, uh, the meeting place of the black ducks. And uh, you know that Rivière au Canar, it's called the river of the ducks. So the Acadians and the Mi'kmaq were all on the same page where it came to the Canard, what we call today the Canard River. Now the Habitant River, uh, you'll notice here the Rivière de la Vieille Habitation. So that's sort of like the old inhabitation spot. So, it's not as well populated as a smaller river than, of course, the Canard and the, the Cornwallis. But the question is, what made it la vieille habitation? Was it because there was old people living there, the first people that came? Or was there an old house? There's really no information to explain what la vieille habitation really means. But it does retain still his name, the Habitant River. And you will notice if you drive that it's actually spelled in French, habitant. So that's something that has stayed. The, the river Pearl is quite small, and uh, there are always families that show up on the census there. And uh, as far as I found it, it doesn't have any other European or Mi'kmaq name. And uh, we know that the Gasparo, of course, has retained its Acadian name. Now, of course, in Hans County, we have the St. Croix and the Avon River, and the Avon River was called Pisiquid, Pigiquid, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, something that sounds like Pisiquid. Now, when Pierre Melanso and Marguerite Muse d'Entremont settled their family along the Gaspero and in Grand Pre, it was Pierre Terrio and his wife, though, who settled in the Canard area. So basically, you have two separate settlements. The settlement of Pierre Terrio and, uh, and uh, Cecile Landry, and the settlement of uh, Pierre Melanso and Marguerite Muse d'Artemont, and basically uh, the, what is the Cornwallis River today was sort of the borderline. It later got even more defined when the parishes were established. So Pierre and Cecile, of course, of Canard, have a story that is quite different then Pierre Melanso, who was after all an Englishman, and Marguerite Muse d'Entremont, who had been born in France, came to Acadie as a girl and was a, from a family of minor nobility. The founders of the Canard River settlement, Pierre Terrio and Cécile Landry, were Acadians themselves. They were born in Acadie. Pierre Terrio was the last child of Jean and his wife, Perrin, and they were a couple who had immigrated from France with their, ch their three children and had four more here in Acadie, in the Annapolis Royal area. Now, Pierre's parents and his siblings were really quite well established in Annapolis Royal by the time he set out on his Riviero Canar adventure. Cecile's parents, on the other hand, were René and Marie Bernard, and they were French, but they only married once they were here in Acadie. René became a delegate 
And usually think of a delegate as someone who is chosen from sort of the way we think of our municipal councillors or our provincial uh, members or federal. They are people that are chosen from their own village uh, to represent them to the authorities. So it was an early form of democracy already, already working in Acadie. So uh, Cecil's dad was a delegate and uh, he had a large family. And how do you become a delegate is a good question. Well, we find that he had a large family and possessed one of the largest farms in Annapolis Royal. Sounds like the kind of guy we want to send to talk to the governor. It's really fun to see the improvements uh, from the census records. In 1678, he had 20 horn cattle and 12 arpents, well that is kind of like an acre but larger, sort of like metric yards and etc. So 12 arpents of land in cultivation. Now 20 years later, he's listed as having even more cattle and sheep and now he has 32 arpans of, of land and cultivation. Now, I've been told by a local researcher who studies census records that increasing herds and acreage is a sign of success. It means that if you have enough feed for your animals to last the winter, then you don't have to slaughter them. And if you don't slaughter them, you have a herd that can increase. So it makes a lot of sense when you think of it that way. Now, Cecilia Landry's uh, parents uh, had a dozen children. Cecile was the third child and the first daughter. So we can imagine she did quite a bit of babysitting. Whereas the Terrio siblings were settled nicely in Annapolis Royal, the Landry siblings were at an age and a circumstance where a move to Les Min made a lot of sense. And since Pierre Terrio was the youngest in his family, he had nieces and nephews who were looking to find adventure, to find land. So it was a good combination for people that they might attract to their settlement. Mathieu de Goutin wrote, La femme de Pierre Thériault embrasse les deux tiers de la colonie. Translation, Pierre Thériault's wife embraces two-thirds of the colony. It's flowery language for sure. He could have said, Pierre Thériault's wife is related to two-thirds of the colony, but he used the word embrasse. Mathieu de Goutin was the King's Counselor, uh, Lieutenant General for Justice in Acadie, a King's writer in Acadie and Ile Royale, that's Cape Breton. So we can take his word for it. But the comment should be a clue, or could be a clue, as to why Cecile is defined by a scandal. But there's much more to Cecile than a scandal. I'll tell you. Around 1686, Pierre Thériault and Cécile Landry, his young wife, she was about 10 years younger than him, which at the time wasn't that unusual. The difference between uh, Melanson and Marguerite Mew's daughter Mont was even more. They came to settle in Riviera Canar. Basically, at the same time as Grand Pré was starting to get settled. Now, it must have been quite a comfort to know that there were Acadians just across a few rivers when you're coming to an area that hadn't really been settled before. The Melansons had come to Grand Pré with seven children already, and four more were born here. The Terrios were childless. But remember, Cecile had all those brothers and sisters, and he had all those nieces and nephews. So. They weren't just totally by themselves. In 1693, Pierre Terrio was 39, and he was prosperous already. 1693, so they really had only come uh, 10 years before. So that was 
that's where we are, I guess. Now we need to move it again because we're still talking about canard, right? We're still talking about canard. We're still talking about the area that we recognize here. So, yes, Pierre Theriot uh, was prosperous even at the age of 39. And, but we were told that he didn't just get prosperous and say, it's all for me. He, we're told that he didn't get uh, prosperous at his fellow settlers' expense. That sounds like a pretty nice guy, this guy. In a letter dated the 9th of September, 1694, de Gouten wrote that Terrio is the most notable person at Les Mines, which is, so to, he is, so to speak, the founder, for he has assisted almost all of those who have come to establish themselves there, and his house is a refuge for all widows and orphans and people in need. Having no children of his own, Terrio took an interest in the affairs of his nephews. Four or five of them lived with him until such time as their own dwelling was habitable. Now, there is tons of clues in that little paragraph for me when I wrote my book, Refuge. That was a great help. That gave me at least two or three chapters. <laughs> so, uh, the unfortunate rumor of Cecile's affair, though, with one of those nephews persisted in records, mostly written by priests or male historians who could have been threatened by a strong, influential woman petty jealousy, or even gossip. We don't know Cecile's side of the story, of course, but luckily the couple's fine reputation was restored by the Bishop of Quebec, no less. <laughs> On the subject of priests, they were mostly missionary priests, or missionary orders. They didn't stay very long in Acadie, and, but there were churches scattered in the communities which they had to visit when they were here. Sometimes they stayed for months, sometimes they weren't the type of guy who could stay in the kind of roughing it, and they had to get sent back, but sometimes some of them stayed. Now, of course, for churches, you are all going to recognize, where am I? Okay, so there. So that's, of course, Grand Pre, and that is, of course, a memorial church, but the church at Grand Pre was called saint charles les mines And uh, it might have been a little complicated for the people who lived in Canard to come to uh, saint charles les mines across two or three rivers if you're in Habitat. And so um, you might think uh, that would be a reason for, let's have a, another church for all these people in Rivière Canard. Now, you might think that's the reason why there was a church built for the Acadians at Chipman Corner. But you would be wrong. It is because of a church controversy. Now, of course, I know that you don't have anything like that today in Kentville, but let me tell you about this one. So this is uh, a few of us from the Ami de Grand Pre who are receiving people at, at the monument in Chipman Corner, which I'm sure you recognize. Um, and this particular group are a group of Cajuns from Louisiana. And uh, when we do tours, we take people, uh, people let us know that they're coming and we take them around the areas that are relevant to them. And so for this particular group of people from Louisiana, their ancestors had been deported from Riviera Canal, so their church would have been here. So for them, that monument that was placed here by local people working with the University of Moncton, I understand, that uh, is kind of the place that tells them it really was where their church was. And so we often do tours. Now, you've probably forgotten that I told you it was set up because of a controversy. Now you probably want to know what that controversy was. Well, it turned out that Pierre Melançon, the head cheese of Grand Pré, remember, he decided to give his son-in-law a prime church pew at Grand Pré for life. Well, uh, the others just couldn't deal with that. That's just a revolt. So they petitioned the bishop in Quebec for their own church, and. Um, that's how Riviera Canard was built. 
1727. Now it would be the last church of four to be built in Le Min before the deportation. Now you probably recognize the name St. Joseph's because you know that the Catholic Church in Kentville today is still called St. Joseph. So now you know why. Of course, in Windsor, or in Pisiquid, there is the St. Fanny cemetery, uh, cemetery, and the church was there as well, the parish. In Hans County is the parish of St. Fanny in Falmouth. On the other side of the Pisiquid River, you have uh, Fort Edward. Fort Edward is on the spot where the church for uh, L'Assomption was located. So famously, we know that when Charles, uh, what was his name? That, that governor there, uh, Charles Lawrence, uh, he came around and said, we need a fort, is that the perfect spot? Of course, if you visited Fort Edward, you know it's the perfect spot. You can see all the rivers, you can see anybody going by, and so he said, no, no, we can't just have your church there. Move that thing, and they put in the blockhouse. So, uh, and by the way, that's my book. It's a shameless plug. <laughs> uh, but there is quite a bit of it that happens at Fort Edward, which is kind of the thing that people don't realize, that people, yeah, Canadians in general, don't understand the importance of Fort Edward, that it was not just a place where people were deported from, like at Grand Prix at the same time, same hour, etc., but that uh, later on, it was a prison camp where Acadians who had turned themselves in or been captured were held until the Seven Years' War was over. So it has all kinds of, of meaning. So, uh, so that's kind of, let's just place ourselves there. So with the help of archaeologists, old maps, uh, the latest book by the historian Paul Delaney, uh, which he studied Winslow's list of prisoners, in collaboration with Stephen White, the Acadian genealogist, we know who some of Pierre Theriot's nieces and nephews were, and we know that almost all of the siblings of Cécile Landry and uh, also who settled in Le Min. So since that was your original request <laughs> about who was in the area, then we're gonna talk about it from the point of view of, because there's lots of families, so let's just kind of focus on those to begin with. So you might remember that um, we had, uh, of course, we had the map of Grand Pre, and we have the suspicious name, the Saint Antoine for the Cornwallis. Well, here's my theory. Who settled right there was Antoine Landry. So he's Cecile's eldest brother. So, could it be that he might have liked to name that river, not just for his name, but at least his saint's name? So that makes a lot of sense. So now you can remember that Antoine Laudry is on the Saint Antoine. Now he had married a Thibodeau. Her name was Marie, and they settled along there. But according to the, as far as we can get, because unfortunately Grand Pre, this area, um, is not as well marked. Even Pisiquid has way more information on which family was where. And of course, Annapolis Royal famously has that map that tells you where the families were. But this area is not as well documented. So we kind of have to figure it out from all different angles. So um, we do know that uh, generally, if you wanted to be in communion with the uh, Antoine Landry and Marie Thibodeau, that you would be walking along the rail trail in Numinus, and they're approximately behind Walmart, around where the sewage plant is, and then around there would be approximately where the settlement for Antoine Landry would have been. Of course, if you walk there, you'll see the dike lands, you'll see uh, how close it is to the river, the uplands, which of course nowadays have them all, but still, you're in the right area. So it appears to have been one of the first villages to be settled, and it, be it became one of the wealthiest in the Minas settlement. Um, archaeolo the archaeologist Jonathan Fowler tells me that Colonel Noble, well, we all know who Colonel Noble is, right? He's famous for the Battle of Grand Pre. Um, 
he used the village Antoine when he came around way before the deportation. He was well known. He was received there. He settled his, his men there while they were kind of checking out the area. So there were certainly some kind of relations going on that wasn't necessarily terribly uh, acrimonious. Now, the other thing that uh, is interesting to notice is that Paul Delaney, um, who wrote the book, of course, tells us that Antoine's son, who was called Francois, he was living here at the uh, village, uh, somewhere around here, um, in, of course, his father's settlement. And um, at the time of the deportation, uh, Colonel Winslow was looking for someone to do kind of a census on what did people own. So uh, he asked Francois to make up a list. So it, we think that Francois wasn't the only one because it would have taken quite a bit of time. So a few people wrote the list and now you can find it in Winslow's journal, the list of the villages and uh, of course the vital information. Uh, there was a village name which Winslow didn't care that much about but we care about. But he wanted to know sons, daughters, cows, pigs, young cattle, and horses, all that stuff he wanted to confiscate. So he, he, he needed th those numbers to be good. So Francois was the one tasked to do it. So all this kind of indicates that there was a certain amount of trust and friendship between the Acadians and the British military that came and went when it was their turn to be in power. Uh, so we don't often explore that part of it, but it had to have been that kind of thing, and we know that over the years there were disagreements and threats, but um, it seems to blow over. But by the summer of 1755, we can tell from official documents that there, the officers are saying, well, the Acadians don't seem particularly perturbed, or they're going about their regular lives. They don't seem particularly threatened because they were used to this kind of thing. They'd been threatened before. And so they just couldn't believe it would really happen this time. You know, you've heard the phrase, mon ami and enemy, my friend, the enemy. It reminds me though of today's news. We're told that the Ukrainians live next to Russia and knew the threat, but they continued to live their lives until the unimaginable happened. I know, I don't know about you, but I've read several uh, novels in particular about the Jews in Germany who didn't know how bad it would get until it got bad, but they had decided to stay, it was their home. And so, there is always political instability. We talk about uh, the Acadians because we're interested in this peace, but uh, it seems like it's human nature to ignore it, to hope for the best, just go on with their lives. And so in that sense, the Acadians are no different than the rest of us today. Well, remember Francois Landry who wrote Winslow's List? Well, he's actually number 178 on Winslow's List. He was deported with his wife, Marie-Joseph Doucette, and their daughter, Ozit. But they weren't deported until December 12th. You see, the thing is about the deportation is, oh wow, like every kind of military maneuver, oops, made a mistake. There were actually way more people and not enough boats. So even to pack twice as many people uh, in the boats in October, you still had people left over. So uh, Winslow tells us in his journal that there's still people left it at the Boudreaux Bank, so stars point that come from the Canard area, and there's all the people that were basically in our new is today that they didn't have room for. So they would have to come back and get them. But they didn't just leave them in their houses. Oh no, no, that, they might run away then. So they were settled in the houses of the people of Grand Pre, who had already been deported. So. You can imagine what that felt like. And so that's what happened to Francois Landry and his family. They didn't get deported until December 12th. Nice time of year to take a wooden ship. Mm -hmm. And so they ended up in Massachusetts. Uh, quite a few of the people from that December ship uh, 
uh, sailing went to Massachusetts. They were in Ipswich um, in 1764, and there's some kind of census. And Francois, like many other Acadians who were in the more northern states, uh, when we think of them as states today, uh, actually returned to our Canada, which was lower Canada for Canada, anyway, Quebec, when, of course, Governor Murray said, well, okay, you can come back, because now he was looking for a counterpoint to the Americans. All right, all right, okay, so you can come back if you can, you know, pay your own way. And uh, there were priests that had uh, uh, big, not plantations, what's the word I'm looking for, seigneuries, who, were, uh, who took them in. And they had a place to go, basically. So that was kind of how that was dealt with. But for Francois, uh, that's where he dies, in La Somption, Quebec, which is a, an Acadian area still here today. Now, in better times, de Goute had written on the 2nd of October in 1702 that Claude and Antoine, uh, two of the uh, brothers, uh, beaux-frères, brothers-in-law of uh, the founder uh, Pierre Terrio, and they are amongst the first founders in Les Mines. So that means we should now look at Claude Landry, who is uh, France, uh, of course, Antoine's brother. So usually you find the settlement pattern that uh, families are close together or nearby. You know, it makes sense. You get help or you, you know, kind of safety in numbers maybe. Uh, we know that Claude Landry, well, guess what? He also married one of the Thibodeau daughters. So even, even more connections to those two because now their wives are sisters. But if you wanted to find where Claude Landry was, well, then you just go to Noggins. Because it seems likely that the mill and the foundations that have been found in Jones Road were probably part of Antoine's settlement. And then the farm market, well, that's Claude Landry and their settlement. So walk along that path on the rail trail and you'll be in Landry country. Now the other Landry you have, of course, they had, remember, she, I told you she had all those brothers and sisters. So there's René, and he is married, and Terrio. Hmm, does that name ring a bell to you, Terrio? Well, just, it just so happens that she was Pierre Terrio's niece. And they founded uh, what is called the Village Landry, and it's in the Middle Dyke area. Um, going to Pisiquid. It just doesn't want to leave Pisiquid, does it? Anyway, there, uh, yeah, so where am I? Wherever I am, but it doesn't matter because, yeah, okay. So, um, yes, so Ontario and René Landry have, have the village Landry, and if you wanted to be uh, finding uh, them, you would go to the Newcomb Branch Road around there. In uh, across the Middle Dyke. Of course, there was a sister called Marie, and guess who she married? Not a Terrio. She married a Dupuis. And they at first settled around uh, on the Gasparo, but for some reason, they ended up moving across the river, probably because all the brothers and sisters were closer. And uh, they settled around where the Port Williams Elementary School is. So uh, not very far from there, a local man who had an excavator talked to me all about the stream that runs there. And so obviously, in his experience, there had been a mill there. And it usually, if the planters put a mill there, well, they didn't have to figure it out. It was already there. And so, that would be uh, Marie and Martin Dupree in Port Williams. Now there's Marguerite Landry, who married Pierre Richard, and they settled around where the Mercator Winery is. So if you are going to have a nice glass of wine up at the nice patio at Mercator Winery and look over the dike lands, I would encourage you to have a little toast to Marguerite and uh, Pierre. So that's where they were. The other one, uh, of course, she's got lots of brothers and sisters, so there's Jean, and she married Jean Terriot. 
And guess who he was? Of course, the nephew of Pierre. And uh, so them, they're quite easy to find. You pass that blue sign, the Highway 358, and uh, what we call Jawbone Corner with the flashing light. And just before you get there, just look to your right, and that would be the village of Jean Terrio. So you're in, uh, in Terrio country. Then, of course, their sister Anne married René Blanchard, but they settled kind of far away. They settled in Grand Pré. And uh, there's kind of, at the historic site, there's places where there's rocks still that the farm, the, the, the men, the maintenance people uh, mow around and all of that. So, um, and there have been other excavations in that area where they found foundations. So you're looking at uh, the area where Anne and René Blanchard were at the village Pierre Le Blanc in Grand Pré. Now, they did not stick around in Grand Pré either. Because, you know, there's lots and lots of them. So Catherine Landry, she married Jacques Le Blanc, and they settled in the parish of La Sancion. So that, of course, is the one that is in pink. So the parish of La Sancion basically is the one on the other side of the Avon River, or the Avon River. So uh, it covers uh, St. Croix and all of those kind of areas. But she had, um, of course, a brother, and uh, he had married one of the Melanson girls, and they settled in St. Croix. So now you have a couple of them on the side of the river. And uh, that's not the end of it. They had three brothers, and their three brothers, Germain, Abraham, and Pierre Landry, all settled at the head of the river here, the Avon River. So there are still signs that indicate where Germain and uh, Abraham were. Uh, they're kind of like, you go over the bridge there, and you turn as if you're going to go back to the Windsor, and it's close to there. But the one that's really easy to find is uh, Pierre Landry's place, because it's now called Castle Frederick. So the big farm, way up there, and that was the Pierre Landry establishment. So we know that uh, we, at the Ami de Grand Prix, we receive visitors from all over the place, and we let them know that they can support us at the cemetery of Saint Fami by purchasing a brick, a uh, memorial brick. And so you can see the Landrys have uh, engaged in this process quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a bit, and so that's always nice for us. Now, of course, uh, there are others who settled who weren't Landry's or Terrios, uh, much like, well, you probably all know about Woodrow Bank, which, uh, you know, that's the little cairn over there in uh, Stars Point, and uh, it was put up in 1950-something uh, by the Women's Institute, and uh, it does talk about the planters coming there, but it says, it does, even in the plaque, tells you that in Acadian times it was called uh, Boudreau Bank. I remember one time I was a guide at Grand Pre and uh, we had a visitor from like Wisconsin or something and he was a Boudreau. And he was so proud of being a self-made person. And uh, I said, Boudreau's bank? You had a bank? He said, oh no, 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 not us. <laughs> we were simple people. I said, no, no. <laughs> anyway. That's just an aside. But there are other families, uh, of course, that are all around here. And I've just talked, trying to make it simple on the Landry's and the Terrios, because they were important. But there were Oquans around Wellington Dyke. The Trahans were in Canning. The Lapierre were in Perrault. The Sauniers were around where the Blomadin Estate Winery is. The Hébert family were in three locations. They're around where the Mormon church is on Belcher Street, some at the Kenmore Golf Course, and in Avonport, just across from Grand Pré. Um, you could have found Le Blancs at the research station and around Grand Pré, and there were Gothros in Walbrook. Now the Grangers were between Middle Dyke and Highway 358, so those two dikes. Around the airstrip on the southern side, there's a little private airstrip there. 
So that seems to be where you would have found the Granger family. They were pronounced Granger when he became part of the, he was a British soldier, the Marian, the Acadian, et cetera, et cetera, and became part of the community. So he, he's referred to as a Granger, but really it's Granger. Anyway, and um, so they were kind of on that side and right across from them, the Comos. And they were on the north ridge of the Canard River. So at some point, it's a little hard to tell if all the unrelated families came because they had an offer uh, by Pierre Terrio. Seems likely. <coughs> it seems to have been a nicer guy than Pierre Manasso, who seems to have been quite a bit of a crotchety kind of guy. <laughs> so we'll, uh, but we'll never really know. Um, <coughs> seems that way, according to De Boutin. So when I was researching my book, Refuge, I took a closer look at the Bro family, since they had always, like, where were they? They had always been identified as being in the parish of Riviera Canal. And I decided that they lived on the North Ridge overlooking the Canard River. I had a few clues that made me decide that. I had come across a document when I worked in Grand Prix that identified Porter's Point as their spot. So Route 341 turns into Lower Canard, and that ends at Porter's Point. It's a straight road right along the ridge that made a lot of sense. You want access to water. Then I noticed that in Winslow's list, there was Le Vieux Como, and he's listed right next to Pierre Bro and his brother Francois. They're all old guys, but it's more than just a bunch of old guys listed together. They were related, and we know where the Como were. Remember I said, right on the north side of that river, across the rangers, the rangers. So it gave me a location for where the homestead of Pierre Bro and his wife Anne Leblanc were related, were situated including my seven times great-grandmother, Catherine Bro, who would have grown up there, on the north side of the Canard River Valley, between Middle Dyke and Porter's Point. Just because you've been such a good audience, I'm going to read to you a few, few, not too much, because it's late, but let me read you just a few words from chapter six. And this is, of course, the story of uh, Pierre Surette and Catherine Bro. And um, we start with Pierre, and then he meets Catherine, and they go through everything, survive. But this part is when Pierre comes from Annapolis Royal, so he's a young guy. He's, uh, what do young guys do? They leave home and uh, head out on their own for adventure or job or a future. And so he's come to Pointe des Boudreaux first, so they land in, uh, of course, that would be the place where you land, because the deportation of the people of the Canard area was from Boudreaux's Point, uh, which is, of course, Stars Point. And so uh, you would say that they must have used that uh, before, obviously. So he comes there, and uh, he's, he's kind of apprenticed to one of the, already, the men who were already here. So that's the setup. Just a few weeks before, he and his co-workers had bobbed along a wheel-rutted country road from Pointe Boudreau to the villages along the Riviera Canard. The men had squeezed into the three wooden benches of the wagon. Then the group made its way to their new housing in a landscape that was familiar to most of them, but strangely foreign at the same time. They loaded wagons, the loaded wagon went up and down hills, through river valleys, and even crossed shallow streams. Grassy yellow-green foam bubbled around their horses' lips as they strained to pull their load from the sea-level farmsteads to a ridge that set, stretched as far as their eyes could see. Well, here we are. Monsieur Bro turned to his passengers from the front seat. He carefully secured the reins, then spread his arms expansively towards the winding river below, 
That's Riviero Canal. Pierre detected a note of pride in his voice. Where are the dikes? Upriver a bit yet. We're building running dikes along the river to make it narrower. When we're finished, this river will only be a stream and we'll have thousands of hectares to cultivate. With running dikes, yeah, sure. One of the engagés mumbled to his seatmate, but loud enough for the, other man, the older man to hear. Pierre Bro was ready for the comment. The Oquenza figured out how to engineer cross dikes to go across the river from one bank to the other. That will only wash out when the tide comes in, the young expert challenged a bit more boldly. No, that's the beauty of the technique. Wait till you see it. Monsieur Bro's enthusiasm was genuine. That's why we need you fellas. They go go for. We need the manpower. Pierre Bro's new engagé scanned the beauty and expanse of the landscape before them. It was hard to imagine the Riviera Canal reduced to a trickle, but if the Terry Bro and now Oquin families believed it, they would have to give them the benefit of the doubt. In 1755, now 85-year-old Pierre Bro was deported to Massachusetts with his 74-year-old wife, and he died there. The church register says he died of a broken heart. In conclusion, I'll leave you with images from the words in Colonel Winslow's diary, 1755. September 3rd. This morning, Captain Adams and party returned from their march to the River Canard, etc and reported it was a fine country and full of inhabitants, a beautiful church, and abundance of ye goods of the world, provisions of all kinds in great plenty. And that's the area you wanted me to talk about, right? Thank you very much for your attention.